My name is Craig Barnes. I have the honor of serving as the president of Princeton Theological Seminary. And it's uh, my privilege on behalf of the seminary community to welcome all of you uh, to this important event, to be uh, one of the first to congratulate OMSC on its centenary celebration uh, and to, uh, on behalf of the whole seminary community, express uh, words of hospitality to those of you who are here as part of the seminary community and those uh, who are here uh, just for this event and particularly the Gerald Anderson uh, lectures tonight. I know that about half of you are from the local community here. Another half of you are longtime supporters of OMSC, but we are all here in Christ. In Christ, there's neither Jew nor Greek, neither Princetonian nor New Haven. Uh, but uh, we were pulled together uh, as siblings uh, who work side by side in the common mission of the reign of Christ around the world, which is what pulls us together, which is what pulled together the vision for OMSC 100 years ago, which is why we were so thrilled to have the opportunity to welcome OMSC onto to the Princeton Seminary community campus. <clears throat> we received it uh, as another extension of our own ministry. And so we're thrilled that OMSC is a part of the Princeton Seminary mission because it's allowing us to fulfill our calling in ways that we could not until it arrived. So this is a wonderful uh, centenary that we uh, enjoy at the seminary community as um, siblings who've been recently adopted into the OMSC mission. None of this uh, wonderful new partnership together could have happened without the visionary leadership of the OMSC board and the extraordinary leadership of its director, uh, Tom Hastings. And we are, will always be in uh, just deep debt of gratitude to Tom for his leadership in making the embedding of OMSC at PTS possible and for his wonderful leadership and not only the vision, but in all of the details that were necessary in making this <clears throat> become a dream come true. And so it's my honor to call on Tom to introduce tonight's speaker. Today, as we gather to celebrate the first 100 years of OMSC's ministry and our covenant relationship with Princeton Theological Seminary, which became official last July, July 1st, 2021, we are keenly aware of being surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses. Many of those witnesses have already joined the church triumphant. Some are present with us today and others are joining us from around the world via live stream on YouTube, YouTube, thanks to the IT team at the seminary. We will be speaking about some of those other witnesses a little later in the dinner program. But for now, with the inauguration of a lecture series in his name, we wish to focus our attention on Dr. Gerald Harry Anderson OMSC's director from 1976 to 2000. A few years ago, when Andrew Walls was leading his annual OMSC seminar with his wife Ingrid in New Haven, he pulled me aside and said, after looking me in the eye in his characteristic Scottish way, Tom, we should not forget that Jerry Anderson built this house Andrew's words were part of the inspiration behind the Gerald H. Anderson Lectures, which in future years will be held at the annual PTS World Christianity Conference beginning next March, 2023, March 14th through 17th. On a personal note, Jerry Anderson has been among my strongest supporters, friends, and mentors during my five years as OMSC's executive director. 
Jerry, I will always cherish our rich conversations over lunch at your beloved Thai Terrace. As soon as I told him about OMSC's decision to move from New Haven to Princeton and to PTS, he said without hesitation, Tom, I believe this move is providential. Now, in all honesty, at first, I had to take his words on faith because, you see, I was down in the weeds in the midst of this transition and making decisions. But now, by the grace of God, working through so many witnesses, with the move having been accomplished, I think he was right. So now we turn at last to this evening's inaugural Gerald H. Anderson lecturer. It is my great joy and privilege to introduce her, Dr. Dana Robert, who is the William Fairfield Warren Distinguished Professor at Boston University School of Theology and Director of the Center for Global Christianity and Mission. By the way, Boston University is where Jerry Anderson did his MA and his doctorate. He finished in 1960. Dana's research and teaching interests span mission history, world Christianity, and mission theology in a unique way. In addition to the School of Theology, Dana is also a faculty member in African Studies at BU. She is an editor of the journal Church History and a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. In 2017, she received the Lifetime Achievement Award from the American Society of Missiology. She has mentored over 80 doctoral students who serve in academic and ecclesial positions all around the world. Her books include Faithful Friendships, 2019, African Christian Biography, 2018, Joy to the World, Mission in the Age of Global Christianity, 2010, Christian Mission, How Christianity Became a World Religion, 2009, and now in its 12th print printing, Converting Colonialism, Visions and Realities in Mission History, 1706 to 1914, that was 2008, Christianity, a Social and Cultural History, co-author, 1997, and the now classic American Women in Mission, a Social History of Their Thought and Practice, 1997. Dana is a longtime faithful friend of OMSC, serving in many capacities. And here are a few of those. Dana was part of the CIMIC program, planning program, in 1989. She was part of the selection committee for the research enablement program, which was uh, run under Jerry's leadership, 1992 to 1999 plus several other scholarly projects led by OMSC directors. She taught in the January seminar for seminarians several times. She spoke at the mission study group three times. One entire study group was devoted to her book, American Women in Mission, when it came out in 1997. This was only one of the three times that that study group considered a single author work to that point, up to that point the others being Harvey Kahn and David Bosch. She served on the OMSC board for nine years and was chair of the program committee for a number of those years. She was a member of Professor Lamansane's Oxford, Oxford World Christianity Series Group that met annually at OMSC up until Laman's death in 2019. She, was a, she is still a contributing editor to the International Bulletin of Mission Research and she's been in that position since the 1980s. And she has placed her major publications in our journal, including the essay, Shifting Southward, Global Christianity Since 1945, which is one of the most reference uh, research articles in the IBMR. And finally, she is a member of the OMSC at PTS Advisory Board. So she will continue her relationship. And finally, Dana is also on the editorial committee for the Dictionary of African Christian Biography, which is a project which was started by uh, one of our predecessors, John Bonk, and housed and supported in large measure by OMSC from 2000 to 2013. She is an active 
lay United Methodist, and in 2019, she had the honor of speaking at the 150th anniversary of the United Methodist Women. The title of her lecture tonight is Dr. Gerald H. Anderson, Maestro of Contemporary Miss Mission Studies. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Dana Robert. I'm honored to be in this position to celebrate the Reverend Dr. Gerald H. Anderson in the inaugural Anderson Lecture at the Overseas Ministry Study Center, Princeton Theological Seminary. Jerry Anderson will be remembered as the maestro of contemporary mission studies. He has guided the field, the movements and ideas that carried mission theory and practice beyond the mid-century Cold War through post-colonialism into the era of world Christianity. Now the image of Maestro is one where he's in a fixed position with the discordant mass of different instruments all around him and he somehow makes it cohere into a whole. And what I'd like to do in this lecture is introduce several major aspects of Jerry's work. I'll talk first about his calling to a life in mission service his founding of professional societies and ministry societies, and highlights of his scholarship. The bulk of my talk will be devoted to the fourth section, his leadership of the Overseas Ministry Study Center and its work as hub for contemporary mission studies and incubator of the field of world Christianity. And the first section is called From Musician to Missionary, early life and calling. Gerald Anderson was born during the Great Depression in Newcastle, Pennsylvania, known as the hot dog and fireworks capital of the world. So you get a picture of him directing his 13-piece orchestra to support himself while he went through Grove, Co Grove City College. But instead of God calling him to transition from the big band era into rock and roll, in 1952, God told him to sell his saxophone and to enter the ministry. Attending the Boston University School of Theology from 1952 to 55 meant that Jerry was a contemporary of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., as well as many famous, especially Methodist mission leaders, including Bishop Kim Hao Yap, the first Methodist Malaysian bishop, and Jerry remembers slinging hash with Kim Howe as they worked in the basement refectory of the theology school. Jerry's first missionary post was a newly ordained Methodist minister doing church planting in Alaska in 1955, but he left there to accept a Fulbright scholarship at the University of Marburg, followed by semesters at the Ecumenical Institute of the World Council of Churches and the University of Edinburgh. Jerry served as summer pastor on the island of Iona. When he learned that St. Columba had died on his birthday today, Columba, the great missionary to Scotland, became Jerry's patron saint, an inspiration for his own life as a missionary. In 1960, Reverend Anderson completed his PhD at Boston University, and he married the teacher Joanne Pemberton. Now it's unclear which was more difficult to achieve given both the rigors of doctoral study and the constant efforts of parishioners to fix him up with other women. But until Joanne's death in 2021, the Andersons were inseparable. After their marriage, they sailed on a cargo ship to the Philippines where Jerry took up post as academic dean and professor of church history at Union Theological Seminary Joanne taught deaconesses, and they had their family, Brooks and Allison. Dr. Anderson's early ministry laid important foundations for his later accomplishment, and I'd like to just mention a few things generally before I get into the specifics. First, he's trained as a historian, especially a historian of ideas. This carried over into meticulous detailed scholarship. 
He was devoted to ecumenism and his time in the Philippines in the 1960s during the period of the Second Vatican Council immersed him in a Roman Catholic context. He brought that ecumenical spirit with him into the OMSC. And he, his devotion to Southeast Asian Christianity means that he brought that into the emerging conversations about world Christianity. And that's very important to remember as part of his contribution. Finally, from his early post as dean at Union Seminary in the Philippines, Jerry Anderson combined work in educational administration with astute scholarship and missionary devotion to the gospel. And anyone who has tried to be an administrator while also being a scholar and a teacher knows how incredibly difficult that is. When Jerry's position at Union Seminary could be filled by a Filipino successor, the Andersons returned home for him to assume the presidency of Skerritt College for Christian Workers, the historic Methodist Women's Mission Training Institute. At the height of the Vietnam War and the Civil Rights era, two years before the dictator Ferdinand Marcos declared martial law, 1970 was a crisis for mission studies. Amidst massive devolution, pushback against colonialism, missionaries returned home in droves. Secularization theory was the reigning academic uh, theory of the day. Condemnations of missions as cultural imperialism reigned in scholarship. And in the meantime, the collapse of evangelism in the ecumenical movement hastened a split among Protestants between evangelicals and ecumenists and set the stage for the Lausanne movement. Now it's in that difficult context that Jerry attended a meeting of the Association of Professors of Mission and found only 14 people there, mostly from the declining and collapsing world of mainline Protestant missiology. Another young mainline missionary, Ralph Winter, who'd been teaching at Fuller Seminary, shared his views and together they determined to revive mission studies and signify a broader ecumenism by founding an ecumenical organization of Roman Catholics and Protestants, scholars and practitioners, evangelicals and ecumenicals, and adopt the term, European term missiology. Meeting at Skerritt College where Jerry was president, a group planned the new organization. And they recognized the need to cement the scholarly discipline by establishing an executive, drawing up a constitution, holding annual meetings, and founding a peer-reviewed journal. And 90 persons attended that first meeting, and Jerry Anderson was elected the first president of the American Society of Missiology. He did not stop his jobs for the ASM until 1988, when he stepped down from the editorial committee of the ASM book series. Now, the changing nature of mission studies in the early 1970s, the crisis, if you would, was not confined to North America. The same secularism and post-colonial sensibilities pressed upon European mission leaders the need to secure academic respectability and a shift toward a broader ecumenical and global approach to cross-cultural mission and related subjects, including interfaith dialogue. So parallel to the founding of the ASM, the renewal of mission studies as an academic field had become an urgent issue worldwide. And in 1972, Jerry was part of an international group of German, Dutch, British, and Indian scholars that founded the International Association of Mission Studies. The e EMS represented, I think, a kind of globalization of an effort to move toward a new post-colonial approach toward mission. Not only was Jerry Anderson on the executive committee of EAMS from the beginning, but he was president in 1982 to 85 and wrote its official history, whose picture you see here in the slide. So Jerry co-founded and led two of the major scholarly organizations, some could argue the two most important, one could say, for mission studies in the late 20th century. 
both of which moved scholarship beyond the assumptions of colonial era mission. Now, while I'm talking about his role as founder, it is essential to mention his founding role in a third organization, the Mission Society for United Methodists, now called TMS Global, in 1984 as a supplemental mission sending agency for the United Methodist Church. This was at the time, the founding of the United Methodist Church in 1968 was accompanied by a reduction in the number of cross-cultural missionaries the adoption of partnership as major focus and a shift away from ideas about evangelism. And in 1983 in Dallas, Jerry delivered a provocative address entitled, Why the United Methodist Church Needs a Second Mission Agency. The next year, 34 pastors and former missionaries met to launch this society. Soon the mission society was sending dozens of missionaries united by their belief in the salvific nature of belief in Jesus Christ. Jerry spent 20 years as founding member on the board of the Mission Society. His commitment to primary evangelism and church planting aligned him then with the major theological position of growing Christian movements in the global south. In retrospect, this act of conscience, as painful and controversial as it was at the time, contributed to evangelistic renewal among the missions of the United Methodist Church. So here you have a person who worked, spent his life hidden, in a sense, working within organizations, yet he was never afraid to challenge either the academic, um, academics or church life. He was never afraid to challenge what he thought of as when something was going wrong, he was willing to stick his neck out and found new organizations. Now his leadership of the OMSC represented a kind of liminal space between academic and ecclesial authority that I think gave him the freedom to influence both. So the role of the OMSC I think is essential to some of this. Next, let me talk about his publications. Jerry Anderson's scholarship populated required reading lists in mission studies from the 1960s through the 1990s. This means they navigated the movement from Western to global mission theology. His reputation was as editor par excellence with an uncanny ability to chart unfolding major themes and to persuade people to write for him. And if you have ever been on the receiving end of Jerry Anderson wanting you to write something, you know what it's like to be faced with a bulldog tearing something, you know, in its jowls. He really never gave up when he wanted you to write something. So in this lecture, I'm going to highlight a number of edited works through which you can see a whole theological trajectory that Jerry was uh, managing, in a sense, as maestro. Now, before he had obtained a PhD or turned 30 years old, Jerry was an acknowledged expert in the history of mission theology. And the breadth of his future direction could be seen by the readers of his PhD dissertation on the history of the theology of missions from 1928 to 58. Anderson is a historian, and his first reader at Boston University was the church historian Edward, Edwin Prince Booth. His second reader was L. Harold DeWolf, the systematic theologian who had been first reader of Dr. Martin Luther King's dissertation. And the third reader was the great Swedish Lutheran ecumenist Niels Ehrenström. Jerry's publications covered all these areas, and if you look at his dissertation, you can see his interests being laid out there. Church history, mission theology, and the united witness of the church in relation to social issues. In 1958, he published an annotated bibliography of the theology of missions in the 20th century. This was multilingual, including German, Dutch, French, and Scandinavian works. It was in such high demand that the Missionary Research Library published a second edition in 1960 with an additional 300 titles and a price increase from $1 to $150. <laughs> 
The basic outline of the mission bibliography, combined with the conclusion of his dissertations, shaped Jerry's first major publication, the 1961 classic, The Theology of the Christian Mission. Anderson divided the subject matter into sections on the biblical basis, historical studies, Christianity and other faiths, and the theory of missions. And these were the same sections that were in his dissertation. For the published volume, he recruited major voices represented in his bibliography and assigned them which topics to write on, including Karl Barth, Paul Tillich, Oscar Coleman, Henrik Kramer, Max Warren, Harold Lenzel, Alexander Schmemann, Johannes Blow, Christian Bauta, and of course, a handful of authors from his Methodist tradition. Leslie Newbigin wrote the foreword. Not bad for somebody who's just like, 30, 31 years old. This expansive Protestant view of mission theology traced major ecumenical developments into the mid 20th century and concluded by naming the potential importance of a, conversion, a converging, quote, radical theocentric Trinitarianism, by which Anderson meant the unfolding idea of the Missio Dei as only then described in German by Georg Visedom. So he was writing at the very moment of the merger of the International Missionary Council and the World Council of Churches. He argued that only mission focused on the Trinitarian God would be a broad enough platform from which to consider the uniqueness of Christ in relation to other religions and other issues for Christian mission. This edited collection reveals an expansive vision. For one thing, it introduced the Missio Dei to an English-speaking audience. It put com competing conciliar and evangelical Protestant voices into dialogue with each other, and it named the theology of religions as a major emerging subject for mission theology in the 1960s. Now, a second edited volume on mission studies in, um, in the late 60s reflected his embeddedness in conciliar Methodism. He edited theological papers flowing from the 10 years of meeting between Methodist professors and executives in the Board of Missions. These papers in this second book in the picture reflected the uneasy condition of North American Methodist missions in the 1960s, then devolving amidst theologies of revolution and the Cold War from a huge investment in, in um, colonial era mission and gearing up for merger into what becomes the United Methodist Church in 1968. Now, as time went on, this split between ecumenical and evangelical mission theology by the early 70s was widening into a chasm. Anderson's own interest in mission theology became focused on the relationship of Christ's uniqueness to religious pluralism and he wrote a number of articles and published biographies on this subject, including in this third book that's in this slide, The Concise Dictionary of the Christian World Mission, he wrote the article on continuity, discontinuity, and related subjects in 1971. His edited work on the topic culminated in his book, Christ's Lordship and Religious Pluralism, co-edited with the president of the Paulist Fathers, Father Tom Stransky, and published in 1920, 1981, 20 years after the theology of the Christian mission. Christ's lordship and religious pluralism was not only broadly ecumenical, but dialogical in method. In other words, he had people from one tradition answering papers by people from other traditions. So you can also see the movement of his methodology as he continues all this work editing. Now, Anderson held to a positive Anglican Wesleyan anthropology while insisting on the necessity of Jesus Christ and new birth for salvation. This essentially moderate evangelical ecumenicalism meant that by the 1980s, he's straddling this very uncomfortable divide and he's prophetically engaged in an emerging missiological consensus of what you might call holistic evangelicalism, um, or just holism, integral mission we might call it now, that became prominent by the end of that decade. 
His role as bridge builder was apparent in his attendance both at the Lausanne Movement Consultation on World Evangelization held in Pattaya, June 1980, and at the World Council of Churches Melbourne meeting on the Commission on World Mission and Evangelism in 1980. And here you see he edited the conference proceedings from the WCC volume. Now what I found interesting when I'm looking through that is in his introduction, he highlights this idea of what we now call mission from the margins. So lest you think that's a new idea, that comes from 1980 and you can see that coming out of um, Jerry's focus in that book. Now here is where it's important to discuss the five volumes edited by Anderson and Stransky, the famous Mission Trends series from 1974 to 81. This is where we graduate students were saving our pennies and rushing out to buy each one as it came out. So my first exposure to Jerry Anderson was as Anderson and Stransky, whoever that was. And so you can see through these five volumes the, tr the trends in mission theology as they are unpacking in the 1970s. Mission Trends 1 covers new trends by asking what is mission, and of course this is written during the era of moratorium, a call from Southeast Asia and Latin Americans who were personal friends of Jerry, I might add. So this volume grapples head on with colonial legacy of mission from multicultural perspectives. Volume two covered evangelization, 1975, a topic very dear to the editor's hearts. They also, this is, reads as a who's who of people writing on that subject in 1975. Mission Trends number three discussed third world theologies, Asian, African, and Latin American contribution to a radical theological realignment in the church. This 1976 volume squarely names contextualization as had been articulated by Shoki Ko just several years prior as the key principle for emerging mission theologies. And Jerry identifies this very clearly by the mid-1970s. The, um, the, the, the works in here in this book include classics like uh, Essays on Theological Leaping by C.S. Sung, The Emergence of African Christian Theologies by Fasholi Luke, and on and on. Mission Trends number four, published in 1979, focused the global conversation back on North America. In other words, the theme liberation theology is used to apply to North America. This powerful volume then is including North America in the emerging conversation about mission and liberation. And of course, that's one of the priorities of the Paulist fathers. Major White Western thinkers like Robert, Robert McAfee Brown, Jurgen Moltmann, Daniel Berrigan, and Jim Wallace were juxtaposed with a section on black experience with entries on, by James Cone, Gabe Wilmore, Bill Pannell, and others. Feminist, there's a feminist section with Letty Russell, Rosemary Ruther, and so on. And it interested me that in the end of their introduction, Anderson and Scransty refer to this volume's priorities as, quote, integral salvation and full liberation. This sounds like 2022, doesn't it? And so, but that's the term they use with mission to and from North America. The final mission trends volume returned to Jerry's core theological interest, namely interfaith dialogue, mission, and religious pluralism. Now the impact of this tr little, these little five books cannot be overstated. Their ecumenicity, geographic and ethnic scope, Identify, identification of cutting edge issues, bibliographies, and timing during the turbulent 1970s at a key height of secularization theory. This made these books household names in theological circles. So this, along with the occasional bulletin of missionary research that Jerry took over as editor in 1977, is navigating the conversation of mission theology from Western-centric into global perspective. Now, all of you who are mission theology geeks, I'm sure you're enjoying this, and the rest of you are like, why are we going through this? <laughs> but I see enough geeks nodding heads in here, so I'm gonna <laughs> keep going. Okay, and another major area of his work is that on Southeast Asia, and I'm gonna have to speed up my talk about his work in order to get to the section of my talk on the 
OMSC. But in this first book, which was published by Friendship Press, Anderson identifies two major trends facing, facing minority Christians in Asia, how to be both Asian and Christian, and how to shake off a ghetto mentality of isolated minority communities. Another book, this is another one that I went and scrounged from secondhand bookshop when I was a grad student, Studies in Philippine Church History, still a classic collection of the major documents about Christianity and nationalism and major issues in the Philippines. And what interested me is when I was putting this in context, I realized it came out the same year as Sinologist John K. Fairbank called the missionary the missing man of the history of American foreign policy. And, and Anders is basically saying the same thing in this book, saying we need to look as historians at mission history, put that in the mix. Now, simultaneously with publishing the Mission Trends series, by the 1970s, Jerry is one of the earliest scholars to state prophetically that by the year 2000, most Christians would be in Africa, Asia, and Latin America, and he adjusted his scholarship accordingly. And I want to point out this book, Asian Voices in Christian Theology, that is still a highly regarded classic collection of essays that came out. It's based on Shoki Ko's idea of contextualization and recent discussions by Asian theologians of the critical Asian principle. So it's about, it's Asian authors talking about how do we develop Asian theology uh, with, with authors from India over, over to Korea, Japan, and Taiwan. And typical of Jerry's style, the 60-page bibliography at the end was itself worth the price of the book. Now, I need to move on and get out of his publications, but I need to mention one last theme, and that's as biography as mission history. There were biography series in the occasional and then international bulletin that I think made it such a best-selling um, journal of mission theology. And I would argue that this biographical pro approach comes out of Jerry's Wesleyan tradition. These two works come from the idea of uh, Wesleyan sensibility that your starting point for theology is, your, is personal testimony. And that's the entrance into contextualized understandings of the Christian faith. Reformed and Catholic theologians start with systematic theology, and I'll say that from Princeton Seminary. Wesleyans begin with testimony. And Jerry's historic sensibility carries through the whole personality of the IBMR. Now, I'm going to move, I've got to move on to Jerry and the OMSC in my last uh, uh, 20 minutes or so of this lecture. In 1974, Jerry Anderson became associate director of, director of the Overseas Ministry Study Center in Venter, New Jersey. And when he addressed the board of the OMSC for the last time in June of the year 2000, he summarized his contribution as, quote, 26 years, 52 board meetings, 95 issues of the IBMR, and over 20,000 residents. Oof. So as you read the minutes and the director's reports for all those years, those statistics are just the tip of the iceberg of what they were doing at the OMSC in those 26 years. And um, let me just share several points about that that I've listed here in this overview slide. The first thing I want to mention that Jerry fostered was this ecumenical le legacy of the OMSC. The OMSC was born in 1922 as the Houses of Fellowship and run for 30 years by founder Marguerite Doan as a furlough center for North American missionaries. And in his analysis of the ethos of the OMSC, Bob Coote points to Marguerite Doan's ecumenism as a defining characteristic of the organization. In other words, although Marguerite Doan was a devout um, American Baptist, she resisted any kind of polarization based on doctrine, and she refused to let that affect the houses of fellowship. So she both resourced a Baptist faith mission and she supported the women's movement in the American Baptist Church. This is precisely the kind of two, two poles that Jerry is trying to straddle in his career. 
Now, the ecumenical tone of the OMSC declined, though, by the mid 20th century as increasing numbers of independent evangelical missionaries came to outnumber the mainline missionaries. In addition, because these furlough home, this furlough home was free, as you can imagine, broke and bankrupt faith missionaries went there and stayed for long periods of time because they didn't, they didn't have a lot of other alternatives. So how do you kind of move, move on from this? Thus, in 1963, the OMSC has to adopt principles of fellowship that say we are actually a broad group. We are not just uh, conservative evangelical faith missions folks. By the early 70s, and Jerry becomes associate director and then director, the study program had been launched in the late 1960s. Now, this study program meant that at first, a lot of the conservative evangelicals felt betrayed because they weren't going there to study. They wanted to go for their furloughs and do their itineration and raise money. But the study program, as Jerry ramped it up, starts attracting mainline Protestant and Catholic missionaries. So he is maestro trying to keep together conservative evangelicals, mainline Protestants, who of course, whose mission theology was all in flux at that time, and Roman Catholics who were still excited about ecumenism after the Second Vatican Council. This was really tough, and I tell you, I've never read such a fascinating set of minutes and director's reports as I went through all of them for this, for this lecture. How he got people to stay together was just, just remarkable. And one of the ways he did that was through programming. Um, he had this inclusive vision, which the OMSC called the consensus of the middle. In other words, we're not gonna be hijacked by doctrinal extremes. We're here about the mission and about people. And so the um, inclusive vision is part of that OMSC DNA. Now the programming, I think, is a major way that Jerry kept all these things going. For one thing, he's constantly itinerating. He's hobnobbing with everybody. Faith missions executives. The US Catholic Mission Association has him as the only Protestant on their board. He's being on committees for the bishops of the United Methodist Church, even as he's founding an independent missionary society. So I, you never see such, when you read his reports, you just can't believe all the places that he's going. Maybe his kids here would believe that because they remembered probably dad wasn't home all that much in those years. So, but by the 1980s, more and more evangelicals are interested in study programs as, as they, as the kind of level of the schools and things, I mean, of the missions they're involved in are raising where they are. So the whole residential study program intersects with the, with the missionaries on furlough. Another thing is the January seminars for seminarians, which was actually consistently the OMSC's largest program in that particular period of history. There were conferences of, um, on mission issues. So for example, um, there are conferences on you know, the meaning and the future of mission mission today and things like that. Um, the senior mission scholars and the mission study group, which kept the heads of evangelical mission agencies coming to the OMSC to discuss difficult and challenging issues in a safe space where they can interact with each other. And through this all, the occasional bulletin of missionary research that then becomes the international bulletin of missionary research is publishing all this stuff and it's, it's got 9,000 subscribers at the, very quickly. And the, converse, the kind of global mission conversation is just swirling around all these things going on. So um, another piece of the, this is the hospitality. Now, the hospitality uh, of all the missionaries on furlough um, you can see it shifts taking place when you read the minutes and the director's reports. For one thing, you see the persistent attention to ecumenism and reporting on that year after year, but you also see a consistent moving to missionaries from the two-thirds world, from Africa, Asia, and Latin America, becoming the residents at the OMSC. And it was 
part of that reason is why they decided to move to New Haven is as the um, number of people from the two-thirds world, the non-Western world, started coming to the OMSC, and, the, and they liked the study program, and the study program's ramping up, it made sense to be in an academic center and not just be a, be a furlough place for people near the beach, but to rather go to where people can use a library and do a serious study program while they're on leave. So the announcement of the movement to New Haven was a very brave move, and uh, that was part of what he, he led. So that's a very fascinating shift, is the change of demog the demographic shifts that you can see in microcosm by the statistics year after year after year of who is in residence at the OMSC. Now, early on, from the beginning, there were always non-Western or two-thirds worlds folks staying at the OMSC. But the tipping point comes by around 1993, when in 1993, there's an equal number of people who are Western, no, that's the year non-Western missionary residents outnumbered Western missionary residents. And it's no coincidence that the very next year, the OMSC la launched the Doan Missionary Scholarships to raise money specifically to help people come from around the world to come and stay at the OMSC. So that was a very important move. Now, toward the end of his tenure at the OMSC, when the multiculturalism of the residential community was a new reality, Jerry, as his administration, was already studying whether missionary training and furloughs should take place overseas rather than the relatively expensive context of US. And the OMSC experimented with holding sessions in non-Western locations. But it was clear the residents wanted to come to the United States. Study opportunities to not have to itinerate, to learn English, for opportunities for their kids. There were a lot of reasons why people, missionaries from around the world, wanted to come to the US to the, go to the OMSC. Another major thing that happened at the OMSC under Jerry was educating for post, I'll call it educating for post-colonial mission. The OMSC spoke into the missiological void and divisions of the 1970s, 80s, and 90s to help carry mission theology across the bridge from the colonial to the post-colonial era. This particular contribution can be attributed to Jerry's deliberate listening and networking among mission practitioners and scholars around the world. And here is where he was very proud of the seminars for seminarians as a place where new perspectives could be engaged. And I think that that program was so successful in the 70s and 80s because it's before seminaries adopted contextualization and, and um, you know, context-based study trips. And, but after, there's sort of a collapse of mission taking place. So they've got a gap in there, a, a moment of opportunity, both for mainline mission and evangelicals to come together. Conferences on the future of mission, including on things, topics like liberation or evangelism. Which one do we have to choose? Simple lifestyles with Ron Sider. Conferences on black theology, Hispanic ministry, and other pertinent topics. And one thing that I was very interested in is that in 1985, the OMSC board voted to divest itself of stocks that were in South Africa where, where the companies did not adopt the Sullivan principles. And they had an ethical investing committee, and in 1994 joined the Interfaith Center for Corporate Responsibility and adopted principles for ethical investing in 1996 that include attention to God's creation. So you see the, also the OMSC to, uh, paying attention to, to uh, moving beyond that sort of Western world into ethical issues to guide the OMSC. And the first Asian Christian art exhibit was in 1988. So that also started under Jerry's administration. So um, let me move along here and 
There's the International Bulletin. We could write whole books about the International Bulletin, but I'm, I'm not going to say more about it at this point because my, the time is going on. But let's just say that the International Bulletin really reflected mission to and from everywhere. And it was, I think it's, it benefited from a strong editorial hand. It's narrative focus where people talked about their personal experience of mission and it's relentless ecumenism. Anything on one theological point of view had a response from another point of view. It was really an amazing thing. So finally, the last uh, kind of section that I want to talk about is birthing mission, contemporary mission studies and world Christianity. So um, in 1989, they, under the direction or the request of Joel Carpenter, who's with us today, and Joel was asked, had wanted to launch this um, religion program at Pew that would be all about relationships, cross-cultural relationships. And when he was asked who should he get to help him manage this, of course, Jerry Anderson was the person, or the hub around all where these things are happening. So in 1989, a small group met, called, it was called Scholars Initiative for Studies in Mission and International Christianity. And that is where it, it presented a proposal to the Pew Charitable Trust for a multi-million dollar program funded by Pew to award grants and seminars for scholars working on aspects of what was not yet called the field of world Christianity. With mission studies as the foundation, Pew launched a multi-year program of grants and seminars that brought together scholars around the world to relate to each other, and their aha moments occurred where scholars realized that they were all part of the same conversation. So here is a picture of the REP committee in the 1990s, and we were the group that helped, that decided who would get the small individual scholar grants and bring them for seminars to talk about what it means to be what, not yet called world Christianity. It was to revive mission studies. But I love this picture. I have kept it in my office all these years. It was really a high point of intellectual life for me. I'm standing next to John, the great John Poby, the late great John Poby. Um, above him is the late great David Kerr, um, a scholar of Islam and Middle Eastern Christianity. Behind Jerry, we see Paul Hebert, the, the mission anthropologist from India. Jose Miguez Benino is next to Jerry, and behind him is Bob Frickenberg, the great Indologist. Next to him, Daniel Bayes, the great Sinologist, and Mary Mott, a leader in the Franciscan Missionaries of Mary. So you can see multiple fields and uh, people coming together and shaping what comes to be called world Christianity. One last piece of this that I'll mention was, is the Yale-Edinburgh Conference. The initial idea of the annual Yale-Edinburgh Conference was hatched by Andrew Walls and Laman Sani and Jerry Anderson. Andrew and Laman chaired, and Jerry was one of three members of the advisory committee that also included the librarian Steve Peterson and Werner Ustorf of Birmingham. Now, as someone who gave a paper at that first meeting, I remember Jerry and the OMSC staff as being the chief organizers of this conference, along with Martha Smalley of the Day Missions Library. And Martha's with us today, too, I believe. After all, it was the OMSC that had negotiated with the Day Missions Library and Yale Divinity School to allow visiting scholars to use it. Efforts Yale officials opposed. Now, this can't be stressed strong enough. In the 90s, mission libraries were seen as obsolete relics that you wanted to sell and get rid of, and you don't need to allow um, external scholars to come and use them. So this conference was hatched as a way to bolster the Day Missions Library because it was the 100th anniversary of the Day Missions Library. So you see, it, it um, hinged on the dates, the um, 1492 and then, you know, 1792, the, that was William Carey, 
1892, the day Missions Library, and 1992. And um, we all had to fight to get the Yale administration to understand that these were valuable resources and the insights into the into cultures all over the world. All these mission records that people had donated to the Yale Divinity School. So that was really the, the uh, Yale Edinburgh Conference was the beginning of that. And in terms of uh, Jerry Anderson, he was right there at the discussions. And um, this, this came right out of the seismic process, the discussion of how do we integrate mission studies into academia. And you see here the term world Christianity is used. And that it's used publicly starting in 1992. And then of course, when Philip Jenkins' big book comes out almost 10 years later, the idea of world Christianity gets mainstreamed. And all you have to do is read Philip Jenkins' footnotes and you see the OMSC everywhere. Scholars who had been at the OMSC who wrote from the OMSC. So the Yale Edinburgh Conference is part of this. Now I need to move, oh, and here we are, um, 23rd anniversary, 2015. Those of us sitting on the front row were people who had been there at the first meeting. Um, and you, you can see we look a lot older there than we did in um, 1992. So let me move into my conclusion now. To conclude the paper, let us mark the 100th anniversary of the OMSC and the 92nd birthday of Jerry Anderson by celebrating how the maestro and the orchestra played beautiful music together. Based on his missionary experience, his scholarship, and his founding of major professional societies, Gerald Anderson was central to the relaunching of mission studies in the immediate post-colonial era of the last third of the 20th century. If you look at network theory, you can see that the OMSC was a hub or major node for the emerging network of world Christianity scholarship. The IBMR was a chief form of communication that united the network and put it into conversation with itself. Unlike the rigidity of academic institutions caught in the discourse of secularization theory, the OMSC represented a creative liminal space with the flexibility to innovate. Rather than being trapped by institutional inertia or ecclesiastical pomposity, Gerald Anderson and the OMSC incubated teams of scholars and practitioners who cumulatively formulated a new approach to the study of mission and to the understanding of Christianity as a worldwide rather than a Western religion. And as we celebrate the return of the OMSC to New Jersey and in particular to Princeton Theological Seminary, what Jerry Anderson and the OMSC accomplished must inspire us all today. Now what they did in the late 20th century cannot be replicated. Knowledge has shifted, nodes have multiplied, things have changed, but reconstructing the past launches us into the next century of the Overseas Ministry Study Center and the music of Dr. Gerald H. Anderson still carries us forward. So please join me in celebrating Jerry. <laughs>